Hi, and thank you for joining another episode of Community Conservation, a series that presents projects, ideas, and people surrounding conservation in Oregon. I'm your host, Sarah Armstrong, the Marketing Manager at the Oregon Wildlife Foundation. And for those of you who are new here, we're an organization dedicated to funding wildlife and habitat conservation work throughout Oregon since 1981. I have a quick Watch for Wildlife license plate campaign update. We are down to the final thousand vouchers to be sold. This is our license plate which means that we can see the finish line for putting this specialty license plate into production. Proceeds from this plate sale and renewals come back to us, OWF, and specifically go to funding habitat connectivity projects. So reserve your plate today by purchasing one of the final vouchers using the form below on this page. And in addition to our presenters today, I have OWF development manager, Clay Augustine joining the discussion. Clay, thanks for being here. Hi, thanks, Sarah. I'm super happy to be here because I had a chance to visit the area that we're talking about today um, last summer. I took a quick little family road trip through there um, and got really lost. Um, and it was very dusty and dry, but very beautiful. Mm -hmm. And so I'm excited to learn more about it. Great. Well, let's get into this episode and introduce our fantastic speakers. Today, we're going to see what it really takes to protect and restore a whole watershed in central Oregon using processes that increase landscape resilience to climate change. Welcome Monty Gregg, forest wildlife biologist with the Ochico National Forest, and Rob Tanner, assistant forest hydrologist for the Ochico and Deschutes National Forest. Thank you both for being here to talk about the Greater Williams Prairie Project. Rob, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and your background? Yeah, sure. So, uh, yeah, first off, thanks for having us. Um, my name's Rob Tanner. Yeah, I'm the assistant uh, forest hydrologist on the Deschutes and Ochoco National Forest. Um, done a lot of restoration work over my uh, 20 years or so with the Forest Service, and that's one of my passions. Great. And Monty, thank you for being back on the series. Can you share a bit about yourself and your background work in Central Oregon? Yeah, thanks for having us. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I'm the forest wildlife biologist uh, and uh, been here in Central Oregon for about I don't know, most of my career, actually. So probably 25, 26 years now. And, and really, um, you know, leaning into a lot of terrestrial restoration over those years, we're looking at um, unifying partnerships to, to uh, do this type of landscape restoration. So. Alan, well, I have a lot of questions, but um, Rob, I think that you have a presentation queued that will probably answer all of them. Do you want to start that now? Yeah, I do have a presentation here that Monty and I put together. So let me share the screen. So jumping right into the project here, um, we're going to introduce you to the Greater Williams Prairie Restoration Project on the Ochoco National Forest. Uh, Monty and I have been working on this project for a uh, little over a year in trying to plan it and, and get things put together and get our partners put together, et cetera. And so things are really starting to hit the ground now in terms of putting the implementation and projects on the ground. So we'll talk a little bit more about this later, but uh, this is a whole watershed restoration project. Um, so we are interested in the flora and fauna components uh, within the watershed, and that's from ridge top to valley bottom. So uh, first off, let's get a little context as to where we're at on the landscape. Um, Greater Williams Prairie Project is located about 30 miles east of Prineville, Oregon. Um, and like I mentioned in the first slide there, this is a whole watershed restoration project. So if you look at the left-hand part of the slide here, you'll see a red boundary. That is the Headwaters North Fork Crooked River subwatershed. And so the Greater Williams Prairie Project incorporates that entire subwatershed. And you see that also on the right hand part of the screen. That area shaded in pink or red is that same area. And as you might expect, uh, the primary. Um, Primary water in this watershed is the North Fork of the Crooked River. So the North Fork of the Crooked River generally runs from the south end of the subwatershed to the north end and then 
goes on to a 13,000 acre um, private ownership parcel of ground called Big Summit Prairie. And then that North Fork Crooked River wraps around to the south and eventually flows into the Crooked River. Rob, can you, either you or Monty, can you take one step back for me really quickly and define what a watershed is? Yeah, good question. So um, imagine pouring a pitcher of water out on in your yard, and it is basically where all of that water will run to and funnel out of, of the, the given area. So does that make sense? So any precipitation um, that falls on the landscape generally drains to a certain point and then runs off that landscape. And so it's that boundary. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so um, goals of the project. Uh, primary goal is to protect and restore whole watershed processes that increase landscape resilience to climate change. Okay, we're gonna talk a little bit more about what that is, uh, what some of the, the climate change predictions are here. Um, in the next few slides, but then also some supporting goals of improving hydrologic function, and that'll be primarily water table restoration in prairies and meadows, and then improving aquatic and terrestrial flora and fauna habitat, travel route improvements, including aquatic organism passage restoration. When I say aquatic organism passage, we're primarily talking about stream and road crossings, so uh, culverts generally. And then uh, upland forest health restoration, early detection and rapid response of invasive plants. So we wanna get a jump on those and not let them spread. And then also cattle management improvements. Okay, uh, moving on to a little bit of the project details. Uh, we've already mentioned this once, but we're talking whole watershed restoration here. That subwatershed is 17,500 acres. And what Monty and I have put together in the Forest Service is a watershed condition framework, uh, watershed action plan. And so within that plan, we've outlined um, several essential projects that are gonna take us to, um, to having, to restoring this subwatershed to a functioning condition. So we've got this uh, $2.1 million estimate on what it's gonna take to put those projects on the ground. And that's over a five to six year period. And really this is, uh, falls in line with, with uh, one of the Forest Service emphasis items these days, and that is increasing the pace and scale of restoration in the eye of climate change. So this project specifically, the Greater Williams Prairie Project, is the first of its kind to do that large scale restoration in such a short period of time. So primary work items will include forest health restoration, Monty's gonna talk a little bit more about this later, but that's thinning, burning, piling, water table restoration in meadows and prairies, flora and fauna habitat restoration, rangeland improvement, so primarily dealing with uh, cattle grazing and fencing and water developments, and then road closures and road reinforcement closures. And Rob, when you said, um, you mentioned that this plan is a whole watershed restoration plan. Am I right in assuming that the alternative is to just be doing these individual items like one at a time, not looking at it as a whole plan? You're exactly right. Um, yeah, the Forest Service, uh, we, we've had a history of doing, you know, great projects, putting great projects on the ground, but but not generally in one subwatershed, focusing on one whole subwatershed and getting all of the work done in that subwatershed before moving on to another area. And so, yep, you're spot on.
All right, so uh, here's where the rubber meets the road. So why is all of this work important? Um, if you look over the last decade or so, the uh, Forest Service wildfire acres burned by year, you see the cyclical pattern here. But if you look at the blue line, the blue dotted line, you see a, a general trend line that is in the upward direction in terms of acres burned. So on the left, on your y-axis, you have the acres burned in millions of acres. So in last year, 2020, we almost burned 4 million acres um, on Forest Service lands. Now, again, that's just Forest Service lands that doesn't incorporate, um, you know, other ownerships. Ron, so, is yep. that statewide or federal? Nationally. This is uh, nationally. Nationally. Yep. Thanks. You bet. So that uh, general upward trend of acres burned. And then coupling on top of that, we start looking at, excuse me, the impacts of climate change. Okay, we are fortunate here in Central Oregon to have this 2019 um, technical guide that was developed, uh, the climate change vulnerability assessment for South Central Oregon. So the findings within that document generally indicate hotter and drier climate with decreased snowpacks and earlier snowmelt. Okay, that's one of the points. Um, another important one is higher peak flows. So your rivers and streams will run higher in the early spring. You'll have more water running off the landscape because it's in the form of wet water or rain instead of snow. And then also the summer base flows, since we're generally hot, hotter and drier, our summer base flows are expected to be less. And then going into a couple more of the details there, summer stream flow losses of 10 to 20% are predicted by 2080. Okay, so, um, less water, more, more of it evaporating. And um, streams are expected to have an increased mean August stream temperature. So the time of the year when streams are generally hot um, and, and those increases up to 14 to 20 degrees Celsius. Now 20 degrees Celsius is 68 degrees Fahrenheit, which is often uh, can be lethal to aquatic organisms. And then also the last bullet there, streams within the subwatershed are expected to exhibit on average a 20 to 30% increase in bankful flow by 2080 due to warmer winters and what I mentioned earlier, more precipitation in the form of rain um, instead of snow. A lot of information in that slide. So um, this gray circle that you see here, this is generally the Greater Williams Prairie Project area. And as you can see, the red and the yellow lines in there correspond to the legend on the left of 14 to 20 degrees C. Again, that's predicted stream temperatures in 2080 for the mean August uh, temperature. So again, could be lethal conditions for aquatic organisms. And then this is uh, just a map out of that document showing the increase in bankful flow for the Greater Williams Prairie Project area. Again, in the gray or blue circle that you see there, a lot of red, which indicates greater than 30% increase in your bankful flows. All right, so uh, that's just a couple items that we're addressing, trying to address in the restoration um, of Greater Williams Prairie. But right now I wanna just offer up a couple fun facts on water consumption to give you an idea of why we're so um, concerned about water and keeping it on the landscape. So um, about 6,800 gallons of water is required to grow a day's food for a family of four. That in my brain is a lot of water. 
And so um, puts it in perspective, how much water off the landscape is needed for that. And then also uh, a mature juniper tree can transpire 30 to 40 plus gallons of water per day. That's a lot of water when you start adding up how many juniper trees are on the landscape. Okay, that, and that's from an Oregon State study that was done actually uh, adjacent to the Ochico Mountains. Wow, and Rob, do you know how many people happen to live in that watershed? In that watershed with the juniper? Um, yeah, yeah, or the uh, Great Williams Prairie, the watershed that you're, the project's on. Yeah, so there are no, there's one piece, actually two pieces of private ownership in Greater Williams Prairie area, but it's all rangeland, and so mm -hmm. there are no uh, dwellings. Gotcha. So a lot of the water consumption you're talking about then here is for obviously the flora and the fauna. Yep. Yep, exactly. All right, let's jump into some important ecological values of the Greater Williams Prairie area. As I mentioned earlier, it is the primary headwater contributing area to the Crooked River. Okay, so it uh, eventually flows into the Crooked River, which then flows down valley into Prineville, the city of Prineville. And um, the city of Prineville has had, over the last decade or so, a lot of discussions and meetings on water source, um, availability for the city and then for also some of these other data centers like Facebook and Apple who utilize a fair amount of water for um, cooling their storage uh, data centers. So um, really important to, to uh, do everything we can in terms of conservation of water and clean water. Uh, also within Greater Williams Prairie, um, it is designated a priority subwatershed within the National Watershed Condition Framework. Uh, it is wild and scenic. The North Fork of the Crooked River is designated wild and scenic. It's designated a Region 6 Terrestrial Restoration and Conservation Strategy or TRACS priority area. And then we also have uh, a fair number of sensitive species within the project area. So the silver bordered fritillary, red band trout, Columbia spotted frog, which is also a candidate species for federal listing. And, and then other notes here, we also have beaver in the subwatershed, and that's, that's pretty exciting. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in the next couple of slides here. And then we also have uh, Native American first foods areas within um, Greater Williams Prairie project area, primarily Camas, but with the restoration that we're doing, there's going to be more added to that. Okay, so some of the valley bottom restoration activities that are within the Greater Williams Prairie project area. Williams Prairie proper is a 560 acre meadow or prairie that you see on the right hand side of your screen. So, um, and I'm going to talk more about this in another slide, but uh, that's one of the big projects that we are going to be doing this summer of 2021. And then also Lookout Prairie, which is downstream of Williams Prairie, about four miles. So that'll be out year work at Lookout Prairie. And then there's several other prairies as well that we're looking at, but, um, and then stream restoration, primarily in the form a, of large wood placement, beaver dam analog construction and repairing planting and caging. So you see there below that, we've got a handful of, of streams that we're gonna be doing that on. So 0.5 miles on Jungle Creek, uh, 3.8 miles on the North Fork of the Crooked River. And then we also have aquatic organism passage projects, as I mentioned earlier, primarily in the form of culverts. So we would be looking at replacing culverts that are undersized. And when they're, when they're undersized, they're generally um, a passage barrier for aquatic organisms to get through the culvert. And so what we would be looking at is upsizing or making those culverts 
larger so that we can get aquatic organism passage through those culverts. And uh, here's a map we put together last year. We need to update it a little bit more um, to reflect some refinements we've made for this year. But uh, as you can see on the map, the light blue um, is our Williams Prairie 560 acre meadow restoration project. And then uh, you can see some of the other stuff that's planned there. Now, this is just the valley bottom restoration. In a little bit, Monty's gonna show you the upland restoration work and it's gonna be a lot more, um, a lot more polygons on this map. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Monty to talk a little bit more about the upland restoration work. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, that was a great um, summary there. I appreciate that. Um, what I wanted to start with before I dive into the terrestrial aspects of the restoration is um, the nexus here. Rob kind of touched on that, where we have a really unique situation in that um, there's an overlap of priorities um, from both an aquatic and terrestrial perspective. So um, it's like the perfect storm of restoration, right? So we have the cool ability to like bring our resources together and really kind of give this restoration a shot in the arm at a landscape scale. So 17,500 acres, when you look at the amount of important terrestrial habitat, and Rob did a great job of like um, talking about the importance of water and the, that um, associated with all those aquatic species um, that we're trying to get our um, arms around here. So from a terrestrial perspective, you mentioned the terrestrial restoration and conservation strategy. This watershed was identified because of um, late and old structure ponderosa pine or old growth ponderosa pine stands. It has one of the most um, connected legacy stands of ponderosa pine on the forest. And so um, very, very high priority for um, restoration um, and those uh, old growth obligates as we call them. So white-headed woodpecker, white-breasted nuthatch. Um, on the other side of things, more of a, more of a kind of an ungulate perspective, our forest is also a part of the Blue Mountain Elk Initiative. It's a four forest initiative to do um, restoration and improve habitats um, for um, elk populations across the Blue Mountain Forest. This um, watershed specifically is a priority watershed for elk restoration based on um, the, the need to improve um, um, elk uh, forage habitat from a landscape perspective and then improve security as well. So, um, so if you look at the treatments that we have here, most of them, like I said, are centered around um, old growth forest restoration, but also have this really unique um, interface with the um, meadow complexes, stream habitats and riparian areas associated with this watershed. So it's a really cool, um, like Rob says, ridge top to valley bottom and that interface as we come off those ridges and interface with those um, riparian zones. Um, it's uh, a super important um, nexus, if you will, again, of habitat and that interface. One of the things to remember about um, how these critters use a landscape is that um, from a riparian perspective or these meadow um, systems, um, because they're so wet and the importance of water on this landscape, um, these habitats um, based on the size are used disproportionately by wildlife. So they're based on the minimum amounts of uh, riparian habitat, more critters use them because of that water and the diversity of habitat there than the terrestrial side of things. So although the terrestrial side is really important, it's amazing the number of species that congregate within these wet areas because of that diversity of ha habitat. So use is disproportionate. Um, with that said, there um, also is this really interesting um, issue with fire exclusion. If you look at what we're faced with and what we're dealing with here, um, it's really all centered around fire exclusion from a terrestrial perspective. You, we put, we've been putting fires out for you know, over 100 years now. A lot of these scans have grown in and from, from a um, oh, uh, conifer encroachment perspective, you know, these ponderosa pine, these old growth legacy pines, the stands are getting really dense. The smaller trees are out competing, the larger trees for resources. Those younger trees, um, including Western juniper, are kind of growing into that riparian interface and they're really starting to choke out and outcompete 
and dry up these wet areas um, for and and so a lot of the hardwoods are starting to kind of diminish and so if you look at the um, list of habitat restoration items here um, there is quite a bit of uh, work that is really specific to reducing conifer densities on the landscape um, so so you look at we you know there's obviously some commercial removal that's happening here um, a big effort for us with this project is the non-commercial aspects, the really small tree removal, which is super costly. That's why you saw the price tag you did. Um, you look at the amount of slash treatment. So we want to put prescribed fire back on this land. So we need to deal with the slash that we generate prior to doing that. Um, and then you look at those very unique habitats. So um, the amount of uh, aspen restoration is small, but like I said, those critters use that kind of habitat disproportionately. So it's although there's only 10 and a half acres there, um, it's um, super, super important restoration for these legacy aspen stands. And then um, obviously the planting and wildlife forage that's going to go into the meadow complexes that Rob was touching on. And then from an elk security perspective, you know, you know, we're in that mode of if we build it, they will come, right? So we're really doing a good job of improving forage, but we need that secure habitat for for those elk to use that specifically calving. So this is a really important calving area. And when you've got cows um, that are lactating and really supporting calves, you wanna keep that habitat as secure as possible. So motorized um, roads are a concern for us here. And so we wanna reduce that disturbance, um, reduce the number of miles of roads on the landscape. And also from a hydrologic perspective, you know, hydrologic function, lots of erosive tendencies with these roads. So we're really trying to get our arms around um, those issues. And then invasive annual grasses. So there's, that's an ongoing issue, med issue medusa head, bentonata, those are two of the species that we're really concerned with. It's hard to get them, get them out once they establish. And so really trying to push those back, got some herbicide treatments planned for that. And then, and then, uh, and then some um, seedings associated with those. And then like I, uh, Rob was saying, um, some fence, um, fencing issues to kind of keep the cattle in control while we we're doing some of the restoration work and getting that vegetation habitat reestablished. Next slide, Rob. That was so succinct. That was a very good whole description you, you just spelled out there, Monty. Thanks. And so this is uh, this is a really cool um, uh, photo series here, if you will, or uh, of the restoration activities. I um, Rob put this together, and so great great job, Rob. So you see the smoke in this in the background on on the side of the prairie there. And, and really that's it. We really wanna put and reestablish fire back on the land. Um, you can see some of the small tree thinning just below that. And then the shot that's right in the center of the screen there, you know, that's kind of some of our standard road closure processes, just bringing back materials. And, and honestly, it creates, when we close those roads, it creates these microsites. And so um, vegetation reestablishes a lot quicker in those areas. And sometimes we give those a shot in the arm too, we'll seed those back in or plant some, um, good forage for the ungulates in there and, and kind of get that going. And then just uh, one of our fire uh, fuels, fuel specialists uh, implementing fire there and gotta love the shed elk shed antler in the, in the foreground. You know, that's just uh, kind of how the Ochico is, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a great place um, and, and is home to a, a very large elk population. Next slide. So this is, you know, uh, the watershed obviously, and then you can see um, the dark green um, polygons in the middle, those, those are some of the commercial harvest. One of the things I wanted to mention was that although we have, you know, 450 acres of commercial harvest that we're looking at, there's also other vegetation management projects in this larger landscape that are happening and that are, that are actually ongoing. So what we're doing with this piece of the project is really um, dialing in those commercial activities that are really surrounding Williams Prairie um, and some of these other um, meadow restoration projects. So we've got other efforts going on in this watershed as well. So, um, and so there's a giant investment by the Forest Service and appropriated dollars to get some of that commercial thinning um, finished up there. The light green is the non-commercial thinning work. That was some of the, um, you know, 5,000 acres of small tree reduction that we had to do. And it's really um, kind of a one-two punch um, where, you know, commercial, non-commercial, we're trying to connect those landscapes and improve the forage associated with those really dense stands. Um, let's see here. And then the control burning, that's the, um, bad with my colors, but like uh, pinkish, mauve, 
Um, I'm not sure what that color is. <laughs> so, so those are the areas that we're strategically going to put fire on the ground. Obviously, those places that we have um, that are really dominated by ponderosa pine, that's a fire adapted ecosystem. And we're really, um, those are our priorities for putting fire on the landscape. Um, let's see. And then the, the red are the road closures and the orange are, um, excuse me, red is decommissioning and the orange are road closures. So you can see the complexity of, of, of road closures that we have in the watershed. And then um, remember, we're putting that in there to improve hydrologic function and secure, secure the habitats that we improve. So, next slide. Back to you. All right, good. Thanks, Monty. Um, so let's move on here to uh, some of the aquatics work to be completed in August of this year. And I just noticed aquatics is misspelled. Uh, sorry about that. But anyway, um, so yeah, for this year, we are planning to implement the 560 acre uh, meadow restoration in Williams Prairie. So you see Williams Prairie there on the right hand side of your screen. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we're going to do that, but a couple points here that you need to know up front. We're going to be moving approximately 45,000 cubic yards of material as part of this restoration project and also incorporating some of the um, conifer encroachment areas, the trees around the prairie. We're going to be pushing those over. Uh, whole trees and utilizing those whole trees within the prairie restoration. And we are going to use a restoration method referred to as stage zero. And I'll talk a little bit about that. And I've already mentioned the aquatic organism passage, but for this year in 2021, we're going to put in three floodplain relief culverts. So three culverts on the very north end of this Prairie. And if you look at the picture there, you'll see a road crossing at that very north end. And that's where those three are going. So the map on the right here is a more detailed photo of the prairie and where exactly we plan to excavate material and use that excavated material to fill. Um, and so the the red hashed is excavation or cut areas, and then the blue and or white are the fill areas. And I'm going to talk. I'm going to talk about um, why we're filling these areas here in just a second when I show you some pictures of the project area. But we are planning four to six weeks of heavy equipment on site. So two excavators, three off-road dump trucks, a dozer, and a skidder. And also as part of this project, we, I mentioned the whole trees that we'll be utilizing, but also 1.6 miles of fence construction. And that'll be to the, to the east of Williams Prairie. And that's gonna allow us to better manage cattle. It's gonna break up a, I wanna say it's about a 5,000 acre pasture and break that into four smaller pieces so that we can better manage cattle on the landscape. And then also as part of this project, we will be doing, you know, repairing planting post project planting and or seeding. And then we just sent out the contract solicitation yesterday. And so um, there will be contractors uh, that are interested in this project will be able to uh, supply us their quotes here in the next couple of weeks, and we will select a contractor to implement this work in August of 2021. So you say, what's up with the 45,000 cubic yards of material? Well, here's where that's going. So um, especially in the upper right-hand corner of, of this slide, you see a six to eight foot gully that has developed over time throughout the prairie. And so essentially what this has done, and I was out there a couple of weeks ago and watching the, the uh, snow melt runoff and this channel, which is technically the North Fork of the Crooked River, 
this channel pretty much captures all of the water that runs into the top end of the prairie, and then it funnels it right off of the prairie. As you can imagine, this is like a fire hose. So you put water in the fire hose, it stays in the fire hose, and it exit, exits you know, the project or the end of the fire hose. <clears throat> That's essentially what we have going on here at Williams Prairie. <clears throat> what we would like to see more of is water to be much more attenuated on the landscape. So it's just changing the timing and um, the, essentially the timing of the water coming onto the landscape and when it leaves the landscape. So instead of running through the fire hose, um, we are trying to get something more like what's in the upper left-hand part of this slide and resembles what you may think of as like flood irrigation. <clears throat> okay, so that, uh, that flood irrigation concept is allowing that water to run over the, uh, over the prairie and then, you know, resaturate the sponge part or the soils within the prairie, and then it'll release that water over a longer period of time instead of just running off the landscape in that fire hose. Hope that makes sense. So this 45,000 acres of, or 45,000 cubic yards of material is primarily gonna be utilized to fill those gullies like you see in the upper right-hand corner of this slide. <clears throat> Just to reiterate that, this is a, a diagram that shows that concept. So this is stage zero restoration. Uh, the top part would be before the project is implemented, i.e. right now, current situation. And then the bottom would be what we're looking um, to have for post restoration. And so again, at the top there, all of your water is funneled into one constricted area. Um, and then at the bottom, it's, it's uh, your water is spread out over the landscape. And so your stream power per unit width is much lower, okay? So less erosion potential um, than the upper diagram. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, this graph is super helpful too. <laughs> Good. You can definitely see, yeah, the after effect here, um, you know, seeing the pictures that you had in the previous slide, what is, it's pretty obvious when you see them all, you know, in a little, um, back, when you see them back to back, but this definitely helps seeing exactly what the before model was. Yep. Good. So, um, <clears throat> I just want to show this slide to give you an idea of some of those cut and fill areas. Again, the red hashed is is the cut areas and the blue and white areas are what we're filling. If you look at the upper right hand part of the screen, that'll give you a better idea of what that looks like on a cross section profile. So that is cross section two within Williams Prairie. Again, the red is cut and the blue is fill. But um, when we design this project, we come up with what is called a geomorphic grade line. And essentially all that is, is a valley trend line, ball of the valley trend line. And so um, we did that for this project and anything above that valley trend line, we generally cut and anything below that valley trend line, we fill. And so we're trying to get a balance there of, um, to get everything back to a geomorphic grade line that's in equilibrium. Okay, so this is a really valuable slide, <clears throat> I think. Um, this is a project that we implemented in 2012. It is a stage zero project, very much similar to the Williams Prairie proper project that we're gonna implement this summer. This project is approximately seven miles from the Williams Prairie project. So that's pretty cool, it's, it's close. Uh, much smaller scale. This was about a 10 acre meadow, but um, was, was one of the first stage zero projects implemented in the country and uh, has been used since 2012 um, 
we've had a lot of field trips out there to see the results of the project. Very, very similar to <clears throat> Williams Prairie proper and in that there, there were a lot of gullies. If you look in the upper right-hand part of this slide, you see that same looking gully that we saw in Williams Prairie. Okay, that, that photo is from 2005. All of those top ones are from 2005. And then the, bottoms, uh, the bottom photos are more recent, 2015 or 17. And so they are post-project photos. <clears throat> Again, if you look at the right hand side of the slide, those two photos are pretty uh, stark contrast there of the big gully. And you can imagine the water just runs off the landscape. And then after we did the stage zero restoration project, we now have water that's much more spread out over the landscape. So we have restored that sponge capability of that meadow. And you can see that on the left hand part of the, the screen there those two photos. So the lower part of the meadow was green, the upper part of the meadow um, was dried out because the water table was so low. And then you see the post restoration photo there and it's all green. So that, that whole meadow is saturated with water. This is a uh, Google Earth capture I did, this is immediately downstream of Williams Prairie. And so was still within the greater Williams Prairie project area, but downstream of Williams Prairie, this is a private uh, parcel of land called Antler Prairie. And this is, this is what we're hoping to see in Williams Prairie. Um, you notice multiple channels here. There's also beaver that are in, in this, stretch of stream, we've got multiple dams, and the riparian vegetation, um, the willows and such are thriving quite nicely. And so again, this is immediately downstream of Williams Prairie, and we're hoping to invite all of this on up into the prairie. All right, so we're talking about this prairie restoration work and I uh, just wanted to throw a slide together here that essentially shows when we raise the water table in these prairies and meadows, how much water are we talking about? Well, as I've mentioned, Williams Prairie is 560 acres. However, the primary aquatic piece, um, valley bottom part of the prairie is more like about 250 acres. So, you saw the pictures, the gully and the water table is six feet down in some places. That's, that's the worst um, elevation difference. In most places, we're gonna on average bring that water table up about three feet. And so when you do the calculations, um, myself and soil scientists um, looked at the soils out there and, and based on porosity within and pore space within the soils, we were able to calculate for every foot of rise of water table, we're able to gain or store or attenuate water to the tune of 95,832 gallons of water per acre. That's pretty cool. So what does this mean if you do it over three foot and 250 acres? Well, you see it, it's like 215 million gallons of water which is kind of mind blowing to think that you can now attenuate that water on the landscape. There's no, um, you know, water is not destroyed or, or whatever, it's either evaporated or, you know, it's part of the water balance cycle. And so um, keeping that water on the landscape, it's eventually gonna run off as water or evaporate, you know, but uh, anyway, changing the attenuation of that. And that's really important in terms of climate change, okay? When we look at the big picture here, and so this is, uh, you'll see Williams Prairie kind of in the lower center of your screen there, but there are a lot of prairies and meadows in this headwaters of the North Fork of the Crooked River system. And this water attenuation is really important in terms of climate change resilience. 
and and some of that stuff we talked about earlier, the mean August stream temperatures, et cetera. And so we're we're going to be addressing Williams Prairie. Um, Antler Prairie just downstream you see is the one that's in really good condition. So that one's doing quite nicely. But also within the Greater Williams Prairie project, we're going to be looking at Long Prairie and then uh, Lookout Creek Meadow and Dudley Creek Meadow. So then you see the big circle there. That's the, the 13,000 acre Big Summit Prairie, and that's privately owned. But uh, there have been discussions here in the last couple of years working with those landowners on potentially doing a stage zero type project over that large scale uh, prairie. So that would be really neat. Okay, at this point, I'm going to turn it back to Monty. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Uh, nice job. I, uh, I just wanted to chat about the, uh, the uh, tools in our toolbox here on how we're going to try to use um, partnerships to kind of lift this off the ground. And like I, uh, Rob uh, did a great job of describing how we're already doing that. And uh, we've got some work happening and, and uh, we've got some contracts that we're that we're uh, putting out right now to, to get this thing started. Um, there also are some opportunities to partner with us and, and uh, continue this restoration from William, Williamsbury downstream. And so we've got two tools that we are fairly new to us to use. And uh, um, one of them is a good neighbor authority. And so that authority specifically, we um, put together good neighbor agreements that we work with um, our state uh, partners. So Oregon Department of Forestry or Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. In this case, um, the 15 miles of road closures that I was uh, mentioning um, from a um, restoration of hydrologic function and then uh, securing wildlife habitat, um, we're using a good neighbor authority with the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and they're um, using them for their capacity um, and help. they're going to help us get those road closures done. Um, so it's kind of a uh, Kind of a one-two for us with uh, our our funding, and then using ODFW staff and equipment to help us get that done. Um, then we've got the stewardship authority, with, which is one that I've used extensively, and it's a um, we're using a stewardship agreement on the 450 acres of commercial um, thinning and non-commercial um, thinning as well. Um, trying to uh, what that does is actually allows us to use uh, the uh, goods or the timber value to get restoration done or the service work. So we exchange um, goods for services. So the value of the timber stays on the land, it goes into the restoration, and then we um, have the ability to use those partners um, to um, help us raise funds to get other um, restoration items finished as well. So it's a, um, it's a really cool tool. We can only use a steward, uh, we can only um, enter into a stewardship agreement with um, not-for-profits like Oregon Wildlife Foundation. And so they're, they're a huge, huge benefit to us um, when we're using these stewardship agreements. Next slide. So this is a kind of a um, progressive model that we have um, developed uh, for for restorate for the restoration work in uh, Greater Williams Prairie, it's um, very contemporary. Um, over the years, with the um, work that I've done with all of our conservation partners, uh, what I've realized is that each conservation partner has a specific capacity. And so, um, like the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, you know, they're really they're really really driven to improve habitat for for elk as well as other uh, wildlife species. They do a great job of fundraising. There is a granting process for that, and they really want to, to convey those dollars, to put those dollars on the ground to get the restoration done. Um, you look at the Mule Deer Foundation, very, very similar. They, um, although they do fundraising, they also um, have a stewardship program. So they are, are really, have really invested their, their um, administrative capacity to help um, administer some of these vegetation management projects. And so very, very strong that way. And so have some relationships, our agency has some relationships there. Um, Oregon Wildlife 
uh, Foundation. They um, are a great fiscal sponsor, help us fundraise for projects like Williamsbury. And then similarly, um, the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board, you know, obviously another granting organization to help with these types of restoration projects. The idea of this, of this uh, restoration model though is really to, to put the ownership on our partners and using all the tools that we have and the strength of these partners to really huddle up around the center there, around the Greater Williamsburg project and allowing the Forest Service to, uh, to um, work with our partner, a partner directly and really have the other organizations really support that, that partner like the Mule Deer Foundation. And you can see that stewardship agreement is the nexus for that. And so, so right now we have a lot of tools. Um, we really want to use our partners for their strengths. We really want to have our partners really take um, the lead on a lot of this restoration. Um, Rob's been doing a great job. We've uh, secured funding from Western Trade and uh, Western Native Trout Initiative from the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. And so this is coming together quite nicely and really just need our partners to help us lift this project off the ground. So. Well, we're really excited to be a part of this project because this is really this really encapsulates our entire mission. Um, so, I mean, having so many other groups involved and exactly what you're talking about this being such a collaborative process is is really exciting for us. Thanks. I, I, I'm excited about it, too. It's the first time we've entered into anything like this. I mean, we've used our partners for their strengths in the past, but like this is something that where where we can because the landscape's so large we can really, really put that energy towards, so. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's excellent, Monty. And, you know, in, in the focus of increasing the pay, pace and scale of restoration, this is vital. We need help doing that. And so having as many players um, at the table is, is definitely gonna help us get this project done. So, yeah, really cool. It takes a village to restore a landscape, right, Rob? Yeah, yeah. Outstanding. Well, um, yeah, that's uh, what we've got here. So I guess, uh, do you want me to stop sharing here? Yeah, yeah, why don't you stop sharing? And I, I know I have um, just two questions and Clay might have a couple follow-ups too, but you know, you're talking about the, um, it, as you were going through the list of all of the different types of projects that go within this larger project, I know that you've explained um, the benefits for the greater Williams Prairie area, but does this work or how does this work um, benefit the rest of the state? Go ahead, Monty. Well, it's interesting, like, uh, um, I think that these projects specifically are great, uh, excuse me, these projects specifically are great platforms to get other biologists, other hydrologists, um, creative juices flowing. Like you can see the restoration that we're doing, the amount of money that it costs and the individuals or organizations it's gonna to take to, to complete that. Our idea here is just to streamline that. This is just one watershed in many, many watersheds across the state. And there are, there are similar efforts that are happening all over the state of Oregon. And there are many watersheds that are in dysfunctional, um, state right now and so like like the things that we do on this landscape are going to just be you know a, a jump off point if you will where we um provide folks with other ideas like rob said to increase the pace and scale of this restoration because when we get done here there's another one to do yeah that goes into yeah. A, oh sorry go ahead Clay. that goes into a, a i guess a broader question i had which is that um, I believe about 53% of Oregon is federally held land. Um, so when we look at that, you know, there's so much land, how much of this land do you think needs work to make it climate resistant? Is there any number out there? Yeah, I mean, there's no specific number, but um, you know, as Monty mentioned, fire suppression you know, activities over the last, you know, 100 plus years um, has built up on the landscape. And so I would say most of it is would need some sort of treatment. Um, now it's going to vary from light to heavy, but um, 
and same from the aquatic side of things you're going to have meadows some meadows that are still intact but others that aren't so um yeah it's hard to put a number on that but uh there's a lot of work to be done. And I think the timing, the time is now we know yeah. what climate change can potentially bring. And the longer we wait around and, and see if it really happens that way, um, the less time we have to actually restore those systems. Yeah. The only thing I'd add is that these are dynamic landscapes, right? These aren't static. Like there's always going to be management to do. We It's taken us like a hunt, like, you know, 100 years, 150 years to kind of, um, you know, get, you know, I, for lack of a better term, I, I use hijack the fire regime, if you will, like suppressing fires have, has created this um, dam of biomass that we're letting out now in the form of, in the form of landscape steel fires. So, so the issue is, is, is being ahead of it, trying to, trying to thin those um, forests, build resiliency, improve these watersheds, um, you know, the, you know, land, the past land management practices in general, based on just settling this land 100 years ago, fairly obtrusive. We didn't really understand the natural processes associated with this landscape. So we're really trying to just reset everything. And I think that folks now that are using the land have, have understand that well, when water's getting more scarce, um, we're having, you know, larger fires, um, the effects of those fires on our legacy forests and you know, things like that. We're, we're really, really trying to get out ahead of this. And as far as um, maintenance or as far as treatment goes, maintenance is as big of an importance as treatment in that like we're always going to have to be applying prescribed natural fire somewhere on this landscape. So true. Well, um, Clay, do you have any final questions or Rob, do you have any final thoughts that you want to add? Uh, no, I just would like to thank you all again for letting us present the project. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for all of your, um, the description of the entire project, which I know is very comprehensive. So <laughs> thanks for your presentation. And um, Rob and Monty, how can people stay up to date with your departments? Do you have any social media or any links that you want to plug? Uh, I think from our course perspective, um, the uh, Facebook page that we have, the Ochoco Facebook page is a great um, place to get information, ask questions. Um, we're pretty on top of that. Um, our public affairs department is. And so, yeah, I would just reach out there. Great. And I can put those, um, I'll put a couple links um, here in the chat too. And thank you both again for being here, sharing the project work with us. And Clay, thank you for being on the panel as well today. Um, and thank you everybody who was able to join the broadcast and live speaker chat of this episode. We release community conservation episodes monthly with wide ranging topics. A link to this discussion will be sent to your registered email so that you can share it with friends or even watch it again. This series wouldn't be possible without the collaboration of our partners and presenters. And of course you are dedicated supporters. So thank you so much and we will see you again next time.